What would you like to start with? One of the, the ultimate secret sources to success is, is, is recruiting players that bring the best ability of all, and that's durability. It's, it's always great to get high-level performers and elite-level players and all those sorts of things. But if you can get someone that's just that's fit and healthy every week and performs 7 out of 10 every week, it's a magnet you leave on your board that for the coaching staff to just place every week and they build around you. Tom Hawkins, it hits home yesterday when you see Tom Hawkins out there. They real, I mean, I know they've gone and got Jeremy Cameron and you can argue what the spend was to get Jeremy in a draft uh, a draft pick sense, but that was one spend. They haven't wasted other selections on, on a full forward for years. Yeah. For a long, long time. I can't remember them trying to get someone to replace Tom. So they've been able to use those other picks for other players, for other positions, for other needs, for a long-term view um, and, and maintain – so they've had, they've had, say, five players that have just put that magnet there and forget about it for, for 10 years, for a decade. So they're, they're, lux- they're not luxuries because they're a good footy club, uh, they're a great footy club, and they've had great players. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rider to it as well. But what it does do, it, it enables you to develop your younger players around the edges with those guys you know, playing the, the steady hand role and taking the lion's share of the responsibility for, for a decade. So I, was just, I just thought it's worth mentioning. Um, because it has such an impact on your, on your list build. So the recruiters don't have to go really in the free agency space or the trading space as aggressively in those positions. So forget Tom for a minute, go, some, go somewhere else with the, with your midfielders or your, you know, your elite level ball winners or, or your, or your center half backs that just play every week. So it's, it's just, it's just one of those things that we don't talk about often enough. When you get one that's just injured all the time. You, you never know. I looked at Hawthorne's Will Day. So Will Day, he's missed, a, he's missed a fair bit of footy already. And you start thinking, gee, what, what, what is he? What is he going to be? Is he, is he, you know, is he just going to be one of those guys that plays 80 games or 100 games over, over 10 years? And we, we hope not. But, like, it does, it, does, it does hit home when you see the other side of the coin. So just wanted to put it out there that I think uh, we, we don't talk enough about durability. So Will Day's gone... 54 games, you've gone 11 games, 5 games, 17 games, 21 games. We haven't seen him this year. So it's not – It's not. Um, we know he's going to be a, a, a high-level yeah. player, but you start missing so much for you, the game can get away on you. And now Tom Lynch is living that at the moment. Tom Lynch. Yeah, for Richmond just well, he's, crawled he, last year and yeah. now hamstring, tendon, so surgery here. So who, who who's at the top of the list? So if you've last, run from yep. 2015. Yep. So I'm guessing that – uh, so Crisp has got the games streak record at the moment, doesn't he? Number one. Good okay. Yes. And so his, he was the sub, so that just stayed alive. Yes, 212 games since 2015. It's good, it's good legs, isn't it? Um, now, Bontempelli and Neil are perennials. Where would yeah. they be on the list? Bont's fourth. He's 203, equal with Hawkins. Yep. 203, equal fourth. And then you've got Lockie Neal at sixth, 202. And Very Boak's good, just got to 350. Work from you. Yeah, so you're, Boak, you're sharp today. <laughs> Boak couldn't have missed many, could no, he? No, Boak's equal 10th with, okay. with one other, and one other Geelong player who I don't reckon you'll get. I don't reckon you'll get him. Yep. You talk to him regularly. Duncan? I, I don't think you'll get him, no. 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 Dangerfield? No. No. Stuart? Nope. No, he doesn't have the 10 Zach years. Tui? Oh, yeah, yeah. So okay. he, just, he just plays. Yeah. He just plays yeah. every week. Um, All right, so Chris one. Jake Lloyd two. Blit, oh, Jake Lloyd. Yeah, Blitzarves three. Bontempelli and Hawkins equal fourth. Lockie Neal, six. Parker from Sydney Swans. Luke Parker, 201. Yep. Charlie Cameron, 198. That's good get good legs, isn't it? Jack McRae, 197. So just starting to get a bit wobbly now, yes. but still yep. still high level. And Zach Tui and Boke. So that rounds out the top ten. So I just thought it's worth putting on the, on the tail. So Tom Hawkins is the only key position player in the top 15. So just, just think about how good that is. Mm. Well, we, we, we're celebrating Tom today. I, I understand that. I get that. And so we should. But to be able to play that, that amount of footy, that consistent le- uh, excellence, just amazing. The King's Gambit for Victoria Police. Looking for a career that gives you more? Search Police Careers Victoria Police made for more. When we have a public holiday game, it's the big issue the next day. It was a peculiar Easter Monday. You had the cricket experience filling from the studio for 45 minutes waiting for them to resume. Oh, disaster. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of yesterday? Oh, they're just they're just so hard to beat, aren't they? The, the, the cats, they just they just find a way and and usually 
um, they make it hard to, to, to score against. They make they make you do all sorts of things to get it on the scoreboard, and they did it again yesterday. You know, they're, they're just a, their ability to get, to be organised behind the ball. You, you feel like you have to go through five different layers of Geelong to actually get them. Uh, and the Hawks did well. They 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 really did well in the in those second and and, and uh, fourth quarters that, to challenge Geelong. So it was good to see them play that way with such such dare and such aggression. But the game the game in a lot of ways when you play Geelong, you have to win contest in your forward half. If if you can't compete in the air and bring the ball to ground, or you can't compete at ground level, you're in trouble. So at the end of the day, the forward half of the Hawks and the defensive half of the Cats. They break square for contested position. Absolutely spot on, you know, break even. But but if you break it up through the course of the day, first quarter, Cats defenders plus eight for contested possession, plus six goals on the scoreboard. So that you don't let you through. Second quarter, Hawthorne plus nine contested possession in the fourth half, plus four goals. Third quarter, it swings back to Geelong, plus 11 con- you know, contested possessions to their defensive unit, plus four goals on the scoreboard. Last quarter... Um, plus ten contested positions for the Hawthorne forwards, so they were getting them at ground level, and they had they had opportunities to put it on the scoreboard. They kicked two goals, six to three goals the other end. So they, it, it's you have to win contest in your forward half to score. So that that's that's why we 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 pay big bucks for key forwards and and goal kicking mids yep. and, and and half forward flankers that can do it in the air and on the deck. So the Hawks forward line, which was all the talk during the preseason. Was really good yesterday, and challenged. You know, Charles can can be brilliant and then yep. poor. Um, Lewis is going to be a bit of a loss again, um, but at ground level, they look that those conditions, they they look seriously dangerous. So, now you, you can see it a little bit with the Hawks there. I, th- I still think the whole thing's a long way off, but at least they got, they showed some glimpses. The weather interruptions. Um, is there? It is the right principle, absolutely, to finish games and you wait where you can. Is there a level of compromise that? Where's the tipping point on the level of <clears throat> compromise? Yeah, it's a good it's a good discussion. How far is too far? Like, is six goals just too big a margin? Um, it is a tough one because you have to allow for all circumstances. Like, we were, we were chatting yesterday, and we, we got you get all this information. Some's right, some's wrong under under immense pressure. Like, you've got you just got to jump in the studio. So the game had stopped at three quarter time. Now, if it was at Ballarat and you'd kick with a five goal breeze for the first and the third quarter, do you go back to the half time score or do you take the three quarter time score? They're the sort of things you've got to factor in. Okay, with the MCG, it's not a factor. But it's it's a difficult one to cater for all situations. Yeah. So I, 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 there's no perfect rule. There is no perfect answer. And I think you have to give a lot of flexibility to those in charge of our game to make the common sense call at the right time. In a lot of ways for me, the shake of hands at, at three quarters, hey, this game's probably done. And I, I think all parties would have agreed that Geelong were the better team for the first three quarters before we put a line through it. But we don't make those calls and and those in positions do. Yeah, it was interesting, The just the quick recent trends, and they were much later in last quarters when the delays had happened in recent times. So the Melbourne West Coast game, um, West Coast kicked 4-3 three to three points after the, uh, after the resumption. So the team behind the Gabba game, um, Melbourne kicked five, one to two behinds. It mm. was a game that was well determined, but the, the psychology favoured the, well, we've just got a free swing at this and the resentment of the team in front. Yeah. Now, I think yesterday was a bit different because there was a full quarter, but also the conditions just didn't really allow, even though it was two goals, four that Hawthorne got at the start, the conditions weren't really going to allow and seven goal burst. Yeah. No, you're right. And yeah, I think you've worked so hard for the three quarters that it's on. It is a difficult one to get yourself back up and going again. But oh, I thought the biggest win yesterday for the Hawks was to see John Newcomb back in form. Back back at that, you know, his clearance best. He, he'd been in for something like 45 centre bounces in the first two rounds of the year for one centre bounce clearance. And I'm thinking that that's just not him. Like, so reactive, not not really not really seeing it. Um, so, yeah, his stats don't read huge, but seven clearances. that that They need him to be that clearance player. If he's not that player, then they're not that team. Yeah. I think Warple's in pretty good form, but they just need they need him. I look at that list and I say, who's the torchbearer for this rebuild? Who's the one that's going to take them forward? And everyone says, Will Day. We don't know yet. We've seen enough to say he's going to be a very good player, but is he the torchbearer? I think this guy's got that capability. So it's good to see him back into some form.
The umpiring of Jack Ginnivan. Where are you? This is a perennial debate. This is the latest iteration because it's in it's in Hawthorne colours. Yeah, I don't think you'd be a fool to suggest that he's not umpired differently to most players in the competition. Um, it just happens too regularly. And I know the umpires wouldn't consciously make those decisions, but I think in the recesses of their mind, they say, nah, not this guy. We're not falling for this guy. And I don't think that's right. You've got to judge every free kick on its merits and you blow the whistle if 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 someone's transgressed. And I, I felt for him yesterday with the first one. I can argue, I can I can be walked down, uh, back from the ledge on the second one, where he does he does lift his arm. But the fact that he lifts his arm after the contact is is a, is a moot point for me. I, I I just I feel for him now because he's he just not getting any free kicks. Not just the highs. He's not getting when he lays a tackle. He's not getting when he's um, spoiled in a, in a manner that's that's deemed illegal if, if for our code. So he's just not getting anything. So I, I don't I don't know if we can live like this. That's just unfair. He's missing three shots at goals a week because of his history. I, I don't. I mean, Toby Green, someone called earlier about. I think he's a, a very good um, likeness. He misses out on a lot as well. To- Toby has to nearly be decapitated to get a free kick. Yep. So I think Toby has changed his game over the past couple of years. Do you think Ginevan? So he's going to have to take some proactive steps. No point being the victim week on week. He's now going to live on the wrong side of the ledger. So he has to change. He's going to have to change. To allow for the umpires to do what? To, to get the, to remove the suspicion or the prejudice that he's trying to draw free kicks every time he goes to a I contest. I don't think the prejudice is his, his responsibility. Uh, I think it was. I think the, the, he has to look at that, the action and how blatant it looks. It does look, he gives an extra source. He does lift the arm and, and he goes really low. But, but there's, there's, there's other players that get those free kicks. There were 11 paid yesterday. And there's that one passage of play where he misses one and Moore gets one mm. immediately afterwards. The same. Hawthorne play advantage, so he never sort of got to live in that moment. Yeah. So if other players are getting a lot less, I just think we've, we've got to find a common ground here. I, I, he has to change maybe a fraction. I'm not sure he has to do too much. He's working with the rules of the day. And, and, oh, and he's no, I reckon the rules checkmated him. So the rule got changed specifically for him, which I'm a huge critic of and have been the whole way through. But the rules specifically changed against him on his action. So I think he he is the wrong side of a revised rule, um, which he's going to have to get the other side of, I think. I, I think it's an umpiring responsibility more than Jack's. He's, he's playing the game and he's challenging them to make a call. Um, I think he made changes to his game because I think he was going for free kicks exclusively and not taking the snap and not not trying to get a handball out to a teammate, not trying to take the quick kick uh, to, to the advantage of the team. I think he has made those adjustments. And when there's no other option, he he takes the, the, the dark side and says, well, I'll try and draw a free kick here. Now, that is smart football. That, that is smart practice. So I, I, I don't fear that he has to change too much. I just think the umpires have to just accept that they can't set a different set of rules for him. He's had, he had he had 23 free kicks, I think it was, two years ago. Four last year for head high. So it's gone from 23 to four. And now it's one. And and everyone else is getting paid those free kicks yesterday. And he gets nada. Not a thing. I don't think the responsibility is on him at all. I, I, I'm, I'm different with you on this one. This is the beauty of the game. We all see things differently. I just think the umpires have got to say, okay, we've got, we've, got a, we've got a problem here. The debate is for New Vision Clinic's Keyhole Laser Vision, next generation technology. Call 1-800-2020-20. The best bits. I feel like this is Adam Muse's coaching. Mm. It was so much to like about what happened on Sunday and then the Richmond supporter response in the aftermath. Now it's it gets curbed by injury and suspension, which we'll get to, but I feel like, Uze's had good weeks in charge and he got this win. And I think he got this win at the exact right time because it's going to be hard to win games in the next stretch with what he's going to be missing. But I feel like we've got our first taster of who he is as a coach and it, it looks a good one. Yeah. We, we hope all coaches go well. We want our game to be healthy and we don't, want to talk, we don't really want to talk about coaches under pressure because it's a horrible part of our game. And, and we go there. We all go there 
too quickly. And 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 I, I'm putting my hand up. We go there very quickly. Um, but they do own, they do have the keys. They are driving the vehicle, don't they? They're, they're, they're the ones responsible. So when you see them play like this, you have to say, well, you know, well done. I, I looked at what they were able to do to to the Sydney Swans in terms of their relentless pressure. Now, it reads as 59 tackles and it reads as a pressure of a 174, which is below AFL average. I couldn't believe when I saw the pressure number yesterday. But there's, there's, there's you, you watch your NFL. There's pressure at the source, right, where you're manic at the footy and you can overinvest your numbers and your pressure will be through the roof and you, you, you subject the opposition to a, to a time frames that they can't handle and they cough the ball up. There's also destination pressure where you want to kick the ball. So if you want to quick kick the ball, there's a little bit of pressure on. It's the coverage sack, if you like, yeah, in NFL, yep. right? So there's enough pressure on. You're not quite getting through and tackling or getting to the quarterback, but you're putting him under enough heat that he has to throw into small windows and everyone's covered. He has to hang on it because no one's free. No one's free, right? So it's the coverage sack. I think that's how they, they got it done yesterday. The day before. It's been a long weekend. Yeah, it's Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday, they got it done by putting the Swans to a pressure at the next, the next point of um, of attack. So they, they, they took the, sm- the short kicks off them, the short 45s. They didn't let them take those 20-meter kicks on the 45. So then they had, to, they had to find something else. They had to explore something else. So there's a lot of different uh, moving parts have gone into this into this defensive work for the, for the Tigers. And they forced the Swans to cough up 19 scores. They don't do that on turnover. They don't do that. So that, I think it was the, the second time in five years that they've, they've coughed up. Um, that type, that number. So that's a that's a great coaching performance because we all talk about Sydney's ball movement and how dangerous it is, and if they get through, you're gone. They can play the beautiful game; they really can. Um, so I, I think it was great coaching, and, and then to get that buy-in, you've got to be able to motivate people yep. to play without the footy. So sometimes it's just great to see a young coach motivate the troops that have been to the promised land um, to get those guys to buy into a defensive plan. Outstanding, and, and the, the the Richmond fans just loved it. So well done, Adam, and enjoy the win. And don't look too much at the outs. For yeah, this one. It's so it was shocking, it's it? savage, isn't yeah. it? So eight to twelve weeks for Lynch hamstring tendon surgery required. Yeah, uh, the medial for Noah Bolter, yeah. so three to five, and the suspension for the moment of Liam Baker for a week. So you you lose those key position players, and. And it's the same at Hawthorne. We talked about it yesterday in the post. You try and replace them with Ruckman or yeah. undersized young fellas who just get moved. They're playing against you know, season campaigners and grids and all these sorts of things. It just, it just doesn't work. So it just dries up your scoring so much that you put pressure on every other component of your game. I feel I feel for the Tigers and for, and for the Hawks how they're going to handle this, this next period. Um, but to get the win, I suppose, you, you would have given up a bit to, to sign up for that win yesterday. Yes. So the heavy cost. But the four points. Do you think Liam Baker has an argument that he was contesting the ball? Yeah. I didn't think that contact was an, was severe enough to cost him a week. Now, but I'm happy. I'm happy that we're overs and pairing it back if we have to, rather than saying, oh, no, no, no. That's just part of our game. Yeah. So Melican left the field. That gets you to low. And then yeah. they've used the... Um, the risk of causing injury, which is clearly there to move it up to medium. So I don't think they would be successful medium to low. I think they'd have to beat it. And the way to beat it would be, you'd have to convince the jury that he was contesting the ball with the arm out and it was clumsy and it was clearly a free kick Mm. that that's not in dispute. It's a legal contact, but there's a difference between a free kick and a report. I think they'll have a go. Yeah. Yeah. They're tending to have a, well, I don't know if they are anymore. They're tending to say, you know what? Are we really a chance of it's winning whether you this? can find it in the margins. Yeah. Can you downgrade it? They'll go for the downgrade, won't they? Yeah, I think they would lose on the downgrade because there's an undeniable risk to cause injury. And the fact that Melican leaves the field, that gives you low. Yeah. If he doesn't leave the field, then you could argue, well, it's actually negligent to low, but I feel like this is low up to medium. Yeah. No, the, well, I don't like the action. I don't want players. Okay. That, that action run has, has got danger written all over yep. it. So if we, if we downgrade that in any way, then we're, we're going to have this this discussion again in yeah. three weeks. So this weeks. is the classically, if we want to nail the action, yeah. then this is the action because it could go completely wrong. So if, he, if he concusses Malik and he's getting four weeks yeah. and you're not contesting. Well, he's probably getting more than four. Yeah. Because that that's, I mean, what else are you trying to do? You're coming back to make contact with the player. And then if you do concuss him making contact with the head, well, 
the onus is on you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, on that basis, can I just correct this too? To Someone's just texting here one one nine saying that Ginman went from twenty one to four this year. No, that's not right. He went from twenty one two years ago to four last year to one this year. Yep. So just make that clarification. Uh, the other best bit. So the Essendon were excellent on Saturday. The grits. Gee. The tactics were interesting. I was on the other side of that coin and on good terms with myself with St Kilda for a while and then good thought, terms. oh, this is going this is going south. I shouldn't <laughs> be emotionally involved in a game like this. Jake Stringer. No no one kicks more goals. I always wonder who kicks the most goals from outside fifty in our competition. I, I, I love I love having a look. Tex Walker last year kicked kicked twelve goals from outside fifty. Charlie Kerno kicked ten. Oscar Allen kicked eight. Jack Lacocious kicked half a dozen. I, I was just, what percentage chance do you think Jake was of kicking that? I got the boys a champion to have a look oh, for me. Really? Horny, horny text me three years. Below 50? Yep. Yep. Is it about 23%? I think it was. Okay. It was low 20s, which I thought was pretty high. One in every five. Even five shots from there, I reckon he's kicking. I, I back Jake to kick more than he misses. He's just a wonderful talent. And this is why you pay the big bucks for those guys. Because when the games need to be won, they want to win them for you. They don't shy away. They want responsibility. And I was wrapped for Jake. He cops a lot of feedback. So when he delivers, let's celebrate him a little bit. I made the point that I think <clears throat> Zach Merritt is the best captain in the league right now. Yep. There's others that maybe, um, and, and people are quick to throw Max Gorn at me. I think Max Gorn's got a lot of support as captain. He has high-level talent around him, Petrarca, Oliver, Viney, who are good leaders in their own right. Yep. Stephen May, Jake Lever. I can name you know, a dozen players at Melbourne. I'm not sure that's the case at Essendon. I think he's done the heavy lifting and, and he's upset a few on the last, you know, the last couple of seasons, trying to get things to elevate all around. And then I see him um, just go to work. You know, his run down chasing and tackling has been... A feature of, of this season so far, just to try and not just not just be part of the defensive actions of, of the club, actually lead the way. I, I think you have to recognise that their clearance game is the best in the competition. Essendon's, Essendon's clearance. Every time I talk to an Essendon fan, they say, "Oh, we need a big, we need a big body yeah, yeah. We, need, we need." They talk about what they don't have. Number one clearance team, plus twenty six on their on their opposition across the first month of footy. And plus 16 at centre bounce clearances. Now, centre bounce clearances are becoming a scoring phenomenon this year. So to be so strong in those areas is to, is terrific. So the, the stoppage game year on year um, has picked up enormously. So you look at their forward half stoppages, they've gone from 18th to 1st. So they're, they're, little, they're, they're little wins that we're not really recognising yet. And they could have easily lost this game and we wouldn't be as glowing. But you've got to recognise what they're doing well. So clearance is on fire. Clearance is forward half. They've, they've gone from getting 10 points to 24 points. Finding 14 points is almost impossible in our game. Yep. Um, so so recognise that. Um, so Zach Merritt's won 18 clearances and they've scored from eight of them. That's a, that's a high number. That's top five in the comp. The others, just to give, put some context yep. to it, Matty Rowles won 35 clearances for 12 scores. Number one in the comp. 12 scores from Rowles. It's unbelievable. Second is Rosie, 19 for nine. Oliver's 28 for eight. And Heaney's, Heaney pride yesterday was was uh, a pride of the weekend, I should say, was 24 for, no, no, half the weekend, 24 for eight. So eight, eight's, eight's a good number. Um, so Zach is, is, in, is in very good company, but he's doing more than just clearances. Yep. They're going to lead off gather round against Melbourne. So that is a high-end assignment. It's a big spotlight at home. This is a growing conversation in South Australia where the Crows a zero and three, and all of that combines David King to put them in the pressure index. Well, it does, and we had them there last week, to be fair, and we called them vanilla mids, and you get your wax. Tex had a crack back. Uh, the club weren't happy with it. Yeah, the, the, the radio stations in Adelaide weren't happy with it. Think you're, you're seeing things. Not They won't say that this week. So I'm, my word for this year is punish. If you can't punish, you can't play. So when you win a clearance, you've got to find a way. Your systems have to then get that one possession onto the scoreboard. If the opposition win it, you've got to find a way to not allow them to get it on the scoreboard. Same on turnover. So all the things that they do for hours and hours and hours through preseason and in season regarding strategy is about turning a one possession, however you've won it, into a score. That's coaching, right? And that's strategy. And that's hard. it's hard. And everyone's got a different way of doing it. 
Last year, the Adelaide Crows were the second best at turning a turnover into a score via strike rate and fifth best at turning one clearance into a score, right? Well above the AFL average. This year, they are last in the competition at turning a one clearance into a score, about 40% below AFL average. Not, not against a good, not, not competing with the best, below AFL average. Yep. And then a turnover. So a turnover, they're also last in, in, in the competition. They're about they're going at 30, 35 points per hundred turnovers when the AFL average is about seventy points. So they're half of the AFL average. There's so much has happened in this first month of the season that wasn't there last year. Now, it all it all to me it either comes back to the midfielders that don't really play with dare. They're good players. They are. They're good. They've been really good players over the last four or five years. Laird, Dawson, Crouch. Crouch is having a very a good year. He's, he's he's having a good clearance winning year, but they don't have the line breakers. They don't have the tackle breakers. I look at Dawson's broken two tackles for the year. He's getting the ball in traffic. Yep. So he has to be, he has to be less accepting of, of of the pressure that's in front of him. He has to threaten to get through those holes and step and go. Showed some vision of the weekend where they've got support runners, but they're not using them. If you give the ball to someone on the outside, the game in those stoppages or those contested areas is about getting the ball from inside to outside. And the guy on the outside, he has to put the cream on the cake. There's no cream at the moment. So it's really, you know, heavy sledding for them. So this is why their forward line's dried up because there's there's no quality to anything they're doing forward of the, of, you know, coming at them. So Fogarty looks like he's really battling. Tex looked, he looked awful. He looked like a man that shouldn't have played last week. He looked like a guy that the back was still affecting. Yep. Um, so all these things are, are affecting them. Can they fix them? Well, of course they can fix them, but how, how quickly? How quickly can you fix all of that? And in that is the, you talk about the cake, there's the revision of what are the ingredients that have gone into the cake. So there's the, the revision work has been done as what have they been picking on draft night? How does it all fit together? What have they got in terms of A graders? Where have they spent their money? So there's every part of it now, and this is what happens when you regress from where you were. Every yeah. part of it is up for debate. It's a little bit, it's a bit connoisseur's choice at the moment as to what you think the underlying issues are. And then is what can be rectified in the short term because they need a result or two on the board. There's zero on three and that can like the maths of the season can very rapidly get away from you. So this is why I'm a fan of the coach, right? Because I think he's 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 got most out of the absolute most out of that group for the last couple of years, and they're, and they're coming from a club in crisis a few years ago, out of a rebuild situation. So this is the toughest of rebuilds, and they never survive, right? So I'm the first to say that. So I think this guy is a chance to be a survivor to come through the other side. So coming into the season. All those things I just mentioned is coaching. Talent in the end, take you to the promised land. If you haven't got those torchbearers, right, and, and it's supposed to be Isaac Rankin, if you haven't got them, then then you, you can't get there. So they've, they've drafted poorly. We said they've been under talent. They, they, they've been a poor list in, in, in my eyes for a while now. Um, but I think as a coach, he's got the most out of them. So, so you can argue where you sit there. It, we can all blame Nixie, right? But I don't think he's got a lot to work with. You know, Tex Walker. So I looked at Tex Walker, right? Tex has carried the can. Tex has been unbelievable the last couple of years. Yes. Right? The two years of bonus time, even by his own measure, has been remarkable. So when he kicks three or more goals, the Crows are a 65% chance of winning. Yep. 20 wins, and this is over the last five years, and, and 11 losses. When he kicks two or less, there's six wins and 36 losses. 15%. So you can say what you like. He, he has made that forward line function. So where are the others? So who have you recru who have you recruited to get that done? Well, you've recruited Rochelle and you've recruited, you've gone and got Rankin and you spent a high pick on Fogarty, on Fogarty a while back. So in, in the end, the, the talent can, can correct that or, or can, can wallpaper, uh, wallpaper over a few cracks, but they just don't have them. They they got some they got some work to do. They got some some clever operating to do to get some uh, free agents to get some trades done to give this guy a chance as coach. PFI, our favourite category. This is Melbourne. So Melbourne have answered the question that we're only going to be able to see. Never mind what we were told. We we're only going to be able to see it. Were they a group that risk 
self-combusting or would they galvanise and forge on? And they have galvanised and forged on. We've been able to see it since opening round and the risk of being one and five after the Sydney loss. Now they look a team bound to be five and one. They look a team that's going to live in the top four and probably the top two for the season. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to get carried away with the win because I think they were afforded some luxuries. So I think Port Adelaide, for whatever reason, they, they have a, they have a, ch- a, a charge forward mentality. Every time the ball's in dispute, they're, they're a foot or a step, their goal side. They're ready to go. Now, if you want to be brutal, you can say that it's downhill skiing. But it's not to that extreme. It's not to the, the absolute gambler's stage yet. But they're on watch. It's only half a step. But Melbourne took that half a step and turned it into three, four, five metres. And they just they just scored from, 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 from minimal... Um, Possession or, or areas that you don't normally score from. You know, they, they made them look silly in the last quarter. In the last quarter, their work from stoppage was was just ridiculous. They only they only won eleven clearances and they kicked uh, five scores. Yeah, so that, that, that doesn't happen. Um, that, that's a ridiculous number. So uh, showed vision the other night. It, it's the ace king queen, as sellers would say. Um, it's Rosie, it's Butters, it's Drew. They're their starting three. So if they're going to live like that, you're going to get some great days. You'll get some you, – you, your best and fairest night highlight reel will look unbelievable, but you'll be having it in first week of September. you, you got to be better than that. So Melbourne Melbourne are a great stoppage team, and that's where they spend all their money. They're contest and defence-based, as we keep saying. So number one scoring team from stoppage this year, plus 70 points on their opposition. They'll plus 20 on port. And in the end, that's the gap in the game. The luxuries in the last quarter. Punish, my word for the year, Jerry. Yes. Their ability to punish – Scores from stoppage, the average is 88 points per 100. They're going at 125. That's 50% above AFL. That, that's, that's a weapon. So you now have to defend. You have to set up defensively against Melbourne across the field for the threat they now pose. That, that's terrific. And the opposition, they don't score. Even if you beat – so you've got to, you've got to beat Gorn to, to stop him from hit out to advantage. Then you've got to beat Petrarca, Viney and Oliver as soon as the ball's in mo- – and, and Sparrow now as well. He's going to be a very good player. So that ball hits the deck, you've got to beat them. And then when you beat them, you've got to find a way to bypass the, the, their, their centre-half back um, in Lever and May when he comes back. So the opposition are going 57 points per 100. So that's that's 50% below, you know, better than AFL average again. So they just make it so hard for you to operate and so difficult to play against. They drag you into the trenches all game. And and it's – if. If you don't do it for 120 minutes, you're in trouble. So I, I, I admire how they play. We always have, have admired Sydney for their, their culture and who they are. We've admired Geelong for, for, for sustained excellence. I think we're, we're going to have to be there with Melbourne. You don't win it every year. Sometimes things work against you, and they were very close last year. They were, they were right amongst it, you know, with, with a couple of weeks to go. Um, but I, I, just, I, I just think they exposed a team that were one step goal side. And they're the curiosity, aren't they, is that the statistic that was raised of their last 19 wins Port Adelaide is five have been against top eight sides. Yeah. Joey said the other night that they'd, they'd beaten one top eight team since round 10 last year. Great stat. So so, who, so are they real or not? So this is – and it's a bit the same with Brisbane. I don't know where I sit with Port Adelaide and I don't know where I sit with Brisbane. Uh, because Port Adelaide can play – Fantastic footy, but they've dropped the game at home. So this this is going to be a discussion all year. You've got to bank your wins when you're at home, and if you can pinch a couple on the road, there you go, you're in. Yeah, so they've got Essendon as part of Gather Round, which is Such a, a good, good game. game. Oh, There's, yeah. By circumstance, a whole lot of these games have just fallen perfectly, and that's one of them. So what we just talked about Essendon, what do they bring? They bring the best clearance game in the comp. So you can't score against Melbourne's, but you can't win it against Essendon. So either they either front up Butters, Rosie and Drew or they get taken to the cleaners at, at the coalface. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to that game more than any other this weekend. Uh, the open question is the Brisbane Lions. For all the different ways of coming at it, at its core is going to be the question is, has their time passed? Mm. The statute of limitations on contending or are there things within, small things within their game that they'll be able to rectify and get themselves into the season? 
because the next little stretch, North Melbourne, which gives them a chance, they would want to find their foothold there. And then they go Melbourne, Geelong and the Giants. Yeah. So if they don't rectify the things within their game, the tailspin would be on at that stage. And I think you've got to, you've got to understand and accept where they're at with their week to week lineup. So this is why I bracket Collingwood and Brisbane in the same discussion every week, because they're the most experienced teams week on week now. So that they, they if there's a shortfall, it's through experienced players. So that there's not, it's, it's not a know how issue. It's, it's a systematic problem or complete lack of form for older players. So you can wear some problems with the younger ones and, and some fluctuation in performance. But when you're this, when you're at this stage and you've been top four for five years and then, it, and then it dips, you have to assess it a bit more critically than, than the normal. And you have to question is the, the passion and the hunger and the, the absolute nth degree buy-in still there? Because it, the disappointment of losing a grand final, we have, we've talked about that for years. It is hard for that team yep. to get up and go again after being, you know, emotionally ripped apart six months ago. So I, I think they're struggling with it. Now, I'm not answering to Brisbane. That they'll deny all these things. And all the stuff they're talking about at the moment behind the scenes is just ridiculous. Forget forget all of that. Let's just talk about the footy. It it just doesn't it just doesn't look the same to me. And then the, tactically they I think one of the great levers for Joe Danaher when he when he is battling is to throw him in the ruck. And when they pick Darcy Fort, you don't have that ability with Joe. And I think they should do it with Eric Hipwood. Mate, you can't go long periods of, of just nothing. Throw him in the ruck and see if you can get you can get a spike uh, out of him. So what do you believe with Brisbane? So the three quarters where they've brained the opposition, first quarter of the first two rounds and then the second quarter the other night, they're plus 11 contested possession, plus 25 uncontested marks. So they win it and they keep it off you. They go down the line wide, uh, boring if you like, but that's, that's how they play. Plus 37 inside 50s, plus 74 points in three quarters of footy. Pretty dominant. Four quarters, four goals a quarter on average. It's a big, it's it's a big lick of the ice yep. cream. Yep. But the other nine quarters, they're minus one hundred and twenty odd points. They get smashed at contest, smashed um, for for control of game, if you like. Um, and then they don't have the dare to to reassert themselves. So when they lose momentum, for them to win it back, they have to win four contests in a row to score. Um, so I, I do think they need to free themselves up a little bit. I do think they need some corridor creativity. Coleman's not there. He was that guy. So it has to be, it has to be someone else. It has to be a McCluggage or it can't be Neil because he's doing so much yes. at clearance. You just can't involve him in the general play stuff. But they have to find a couple of players. And I look at, we, we go straight to Rayner and Bailey every time because they're high level players. But I want to throw Charlie Cameron in the mix. What's the point of having Charlie? at full forward, starving for long periods of the game. They've got to get him in the middle of the ground. They've got to use his speed. They don't have that speed around the ball. So it's the Rankin discussion in Adelaide with, with Charlie in Brisbane. You've got an asset there. Don't have it dying on the vine. Get it involved. And, and when, when things are failing, you've got to pull something. You've got to break glass. What's their break glass? So that's, that's where I sit with Brisbane. I still think they've got a lot of talent. It's underperforming. Is is it is it the end of their era? I, I don't know. But they've been up for a long time and history shows us. After five, six, seven years, it tips quite quickly. The only one that's bucked that trend is is Hawthorne, who did it through the the two new franchises and, and free agency coming in. That they, they were they had some spoils that no one else has got. I'm not denigrating them, just stating facts, and they went for ten years. And Geelong, who dipped for eight weeks, I reckon. And they got Dangerfield, and then they got they obviously got Cameron at the end of it, and and bang, they, they win another one. But and that they're, they're the exceptions. The rest of, of of history shows us that you get a, you got a window. If they don't win it this year, there'll be no one tipping them next year. There'll be no one tipping them the year after that. So I, this is this is this right now. It is on for Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. They're an open question. Uh, we won't get any answers this week, but the three weeks after that, we'll probably learn everything we need to learn. Um, well, what would you do if you were Chris Fagan? What what levers would you pull? Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't 
die without trying now. And the North Melbourne game does give you a chance to, let's have, have a look at this and see if it'll work. And you take a bit of a punt within game that if it doesn't quite work, you'll be able to rectify and still win. Start Charlie Cameron in a centre bounce. Yeah, and yeah. And let him trade forward after that. Yeah. But you and I have always been big subscribers on the Danaher thing. Is he, he ha- You have to run him up through the ruck. It, it gets him into the game. Like He was their best player. I'll argue all day long he was their best player in the grand final against Collingwood. And then you took that away from him. That was a, that was a miscalculation. Um, I'm not giving up on them, but I think it's all in play. All of it's in play. And teams who have been right there, right there, right there, when the floor drops out underneath them, they go quickly. So that's why we'll know. We'll know after seven rounds. If they're four and three and have balanced up, if they're three and four, they'll be in a tooth and nail struggle. If they're two and five or one and six, is the year won't amount to a hill of beans. So we're about to find out, I think, yeah, on the line. If they're not in your seats. <laughs> Took heavy feedback last week for having Carlton above hey, Sydney. Yeah, I'm, I'm can, happy with my you're choices. Of the game here. You do your own seatings. <laughs> we'll do ours. What are the rules? Put them up. What are the rules? Well, they should be volatile. They should reflect what's happening right now. They're not a forecast of what's going to happen at the end. Okay. And just however you see it is perfectly fine. Well, at four, I'm leaving Fremantle. (laughs) I'm leaving them there, Jerry. I'm not moving them until they give me a reason to move them. So there's no reason to move them. You're putting a ban on West Coast games. I'll tell you what. I'm not that far off Fremantle games. That I've, was a snore fest. It was. I've got Sydney at four. They slide a couple of places. They're not sliding out. You've, Three? You've kept them. I've I got uh, I've Melbourne kept. in there. That was, a, that was a performance, and you have to reward winning on the road. Yep. Uh, the Giants were at three for me anyway, so they're just staying anchored at three. They, they didn't play. You left out. I've got, uh, I've got Carlton at two. For all the reasons. They're doing it without Walsh, weathering back in. They, they're just they, – sorry, they're just going to – they're winning in ways that they didn't win last year. Mm. Ball movement, pressure, and all those sort of things. I'm really impressed with them. I've got Melbourne at two. Really, really liked everything around it as well as how they played. One. GWS for mine, but I'm really looking forward to seeing them against someone strong. Carlton are at one. So my one. I pinned them there till they lose, and I did wobble a little bit. I held to it, but I wobbled. I, I'm all right with it. I feel like you're going to be wedded to them for the first half of the year. Yeah, yeah. Carlton are at one.